spoken lately. I haven't thought about flying for a long time. I have a dream that at that moment, when I was alone above the clouds for a long time, I have dreamed of waking up in a room surrounded in blue and green grass for more years than I could dream of memory. I haven't walked back into the past or scratched on the doors of my origins, where it all came from, since I held up that cape for the last time. Return to Kent Town 10th year anniversary edition is a revised version of Andy Ann's first poetry book. The book can be purchased from Amazon and it contains numerous additional material. Spoken Label. Hi, it's Andy Ann from Spoken Label. A spoken label was originally set up at the beginning of 2016 and records show it started off really as a one-off podcast chatting to writers, poets and artists. Over time it became monthly, then weekly and occasionally nowadays it goes on that to a more regular basis. To date I've done over 330 sessions and I'm always looking for new poets, writers, artists, singer-songwriters, general interesting creative people to come onto the podcast. You can find this on all the usual networks over Apple, iTunes, Spotify, Podbean, Podbay and dozens of others. But it does have a central database of spoken label, which is all one word, dot bandcamp.com. Obviously now, to help me with the running costs of this podcast, I'm always grateful for any kind of donation to assist me with it. You can even do the donation through the Bandcamp page by putting in a fee to download one of the free podcasts, or send it over to my PayPal to aen1mpo at yahoo.co.uk. My email address again is aen1mpo at yahoo.co.uk. Enjoy the podcast. Take care. Bye. Spoken Label. Hi, guys. Andy and Spoken Label. Back in the house. Yes, anyone who's listened to the podcast with Mark Jackson from the other day would have noticed this is my second podcast today in Spoken Label. And I've got a third one coming later today, but that's with Cloak to the Shadow. So today, now we've got a wonderful singer songwriter with us today yes and also poet as well now i've met this young lady i reckon i've seen her at beginning of the year because she read at speakeasy is either beginning this year or back end of last year and she's fantastic yeah back end of last year i thought it was sorry so back end yeah. of so yeah i've got the wonderful sarah jane with us now i wanted to talk to sarah today because as well as being a really good poet and i think she's a real name to watch she's also a, a fantastic singer songwriter in her own right so and I thought it'd be great to talk to Sarah today about the differences in the two mediums. So now, Sarah, obviously, for people who don't know you then, first of all, give us the introduction to yourself. And where did all your creativity come from originally? And what led you in, into singing first then? Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so um, my name's Sarah Jane. Uh, I'm 28 years of age uh, and I live and grew up in Manchester. Um, and I think it's interesting that you that you, you pose the question of where does you know your creativity come from because I think for the longest time I didn't consider myself a creative person and I think um, particularly huh. as a millennial growing up I don't know I think <laughs> when I thought when I thought of a creative person I thought somebody who can who can draw who is you know physically mm. really good at um, you know making these you know creative masterpieces I didn't understand the concept of kind of having creative thoughts or or mm. words that flew you know kind of um that, that came out in, in an artistic way so um I think my creativity came from the frustration with that and I think I, I kind of um you know I was very much a, a bedroom singer for the longest time We really um, and, and, oh yeah yeah wow. definitely um and then I think it's as, as you kind of mature and and you you go through the rhythm of life and you figure out what works for you, what what you know what triggers the spark and the passion within you. Mm. Um, and I've had many corporate kind of jobs, which you know they can be a, a little bit soul destroying. And then I think 
it's that kind of going away and and, and looking inside yourself and, and what sparks the passion within you that then that kind of ignites that fire in a most in a in a more strong way so by having those kind of almost soul destroying experiences within you know you know different jobs in the past um it's it's kind of led me to this place now of, of being able to really reflect um and 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 see the beauty in, in the world around me but also to make this you know kind of make sense of of of, of things that just don't don't make sense initially I, I love the idea of you know a play on words and, and double yeah. meanings and, and 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 everyone kind of being able to make their own um conclusion of, of, of what they think my poetry is about or how it how it's you know it reads to them um right. so that's yeah that's essentially kind of where my creativity comes from brilliant yeah yeah it's fantastic like it's I've obviously I've said to you off mic before. I've met quite a few singer songwriters over the years, and I've not really come across many that I think can do what you're doing. The bold medium is such a really, really good way because like, people will put the links up later on. But if you're singing, you've got a really, really powerful voice straight away with it. Now, obviously, we'll look at the singing side of things first because I want to talk, talk about the poetry more next, certainly. But like I said, tell us about this. You said you were a, you were a bedroom singer basically for some years, then weren't you? So where did it come yeah. from to make you want to start performing with the singing then? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think I think as many, you know, uh, many people who start off singing, you know, it, it's, it's something you do from from the youngest of, of ages. And I always remember kind of having like these little like singing competitions between me and my sister and my mum would, um, you know, kind of, she was like, you know, kind of the Simon Cowell and she'd decide who was the winner. And I was always so... Um, ecstatic whenever my mum was like yep Sarah your voice was spot on amazing um, and and, and I, I just always had this passion for, for singing it's very much um, it's, it's um, a creative um, release in a way but in, it's so different to poetry and um, when I sing I, 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 if I'm singing for myself it's because I'm happy a lot of the time whereas when I'm writing poetry it can come from a place of of maybe not being as happy or, or being more reflective um, and I think, you know, it, it all boils down to confidence as well. I think I never really, I didn't, you know, I wasn't privileged enough to, to be able to kind of have, you know, singing lessons or anything like that, unfortunately. Um, so I kind of really got myself to where I am, um, just kind of watching YouTube videos and and and, and wow. kind of figuring it out that way. And and for the longest time, as I say, I would just, kind of, I, it was something I did for myself. I didn't want to kind of taint it or, or, or ruin how much I love music um, yeah, by, by kind of saturating myself with it all the time. But as I say, I think as you kind of, you get older, you you, you learn what you gravitate towards too, and, and you just want more of that in your life. Um, so then I started uh, reaching out on kind of like Facebook groups to see if there's any other musicians who were interested in, in kind of rehearsing or playing alongside. So kind of like guitarists, piano players, that kind of thing. And then I kind of met a, you know, really exciting group of people that way. Um, and I started to rehearse in, in, in different studios in Manchester. Um, yeah. just And it was just so lovely to kind of vibe off other people with similar interests. Um, and then we started going to open mic nights um, across kind of like Chawton, um, Manchester, Salford area. Um, and that was really, um, you know, re really great exposure. So I think bit by bit, I've kind of dipped my toe in. And then kind of from there on, it was uh, just before, uh, no, it was uh, just after lockdown, actually. Um, I was at one of the open mic nights and the event manager of that open mic night um, came over to us and said, oh, you guys were great. We'd love to have you um, at, at our summer festival. Oh, and that's wow. when I then started to think, oh, OK, actually, I, you know, I, I can do this in a, in a more kind of professional capacity. Um, and then from there on, it just kind of led me to um, all these different opportunities of being able to sing at, at restaurants, birthdays, um, you know, kind of bars, uh, like, lots of different events. And, you know, I, I just I, I just I love it. I really do. Yeah, it shows in your videos, like I said, it's it's worth obviously give us the credit first of all because when i was researching it earlier on today i know you had a duo going at one point called soundboard didn't sound bad said soundboard and sound bound <laughs> <laughs> as well as your, your solo stuff as well so yeah it basically it, both are really really excellent now i want to ask you obviously we we'll have to touch on sound banks i think it really was a good little duo you had there as well mm -hmm. tell us about how do you feel how does it feel for you then being a singer when you're actually yeah. in a band and i was doing it solo mm -hmm. by yourself I think it's different experience altogether. Massively, I, I really do think so. And if I'm being totally honest, I I enjoy singing with 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 live music accompaniment next to me, um, way more than kind of you know singing with backing tracks because it is it's the it's the real you know it's completely the real deal. It's 
there's just something really capturing about you know going to any event and, and seeing live music it just sparks something so much more within you than just having you know backing tracks playing or or um you know just audio playing on a speaker there's there is you know you, there's heart and soul in in music there really is and i think you really feel that when it's when it's live so i i absolutely love it but from a from a kind of like logistics perspective it's 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 you know it's it's, it's easier to be able to sing on my own because i'm my own boss in a way so um you know i can i can dictate the songs that i want to sing i can dictate um, when I want to rehearse, how I want to rehearse, you know, very much being a one-man band, you have that independence. But it's with anything creative, it's so important to kind of bounce off other other people's energies and and, and creativity. So that's the the aspect that I think being a, a solo singer with backing tracks lacks ever so slightly. Yeah, I've done it myself before when I I said it's too much. I can't sing really. I could scream, but I'll sing. But yeah, no, I know what you mean. That is. It's a different experience altogether when you're doing it solo and with, with the band, definitely. So now, obviously, mm-hmm. I know you've not just played England, have you? So I did ask you about this before, so and I wanted to learn a bit more about your experience. You told me before you've done a few open mics, haven't you, over in Dubai? So mm-hmm. I want to learn about the experience, what it's like playing in Dubai, because that must have been a completely different atmosphere to playing like in Manchester and the northwest of England altogether. Yeah and no. I mean, so when I so I spent two months in Dubai and it was a period of and it was just before um the lockdown. So again, it was I was at a point in my life where I was frustrated with the nine to five, the corporate, and I just wanted a new experience and a new adventure. So that's where um, I was offered a position in Dubai and, and I took it. But um I was really interested to see how much live music was such a thing over there. Mm. And I actually think only since lockdown, um live music has become more of a thing here in, in, in England but there was this it's such a presence over there and it was really nice to see um but I, in terms of singing over there it was it was lovely for me because it was a piece of home if that makes sense yeah so going to all these open mic nights in 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 Manchester and in England was very much you know my familiar space so to then do that there it was so comforting to see you know different musicians doing the, the same thing you know is music unites at the end of the day um and it felt i just i just felt like i was at home for 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 a brief moment oh yeah completely did you find, yeah. pardon me pardon me my voice is going then did you find when you're in dubai then did you obviously you would have heard people doing songs in different ways that you would have heard in this country and i suspect we, you must have come away from the ideas of some songs from within dubai like that whether it's ones you're going to write or arrangements of songs in different ways um, yeah, I think with Dubai, there's so many different cultures who kind of everyone who is there is an expat. So you're all kind of in the same boat. Um, so you do definitely get to see different ways of of, of, of singing and, and, and their creativity. But what I will say and what I must say is that I, um, for me, poetry and singing, as much as they're both creative outlets, they're very in, in very different spaces for me. And that's that's how I am able to 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 do both. So mm. I haven't managed to find a space as yet where I can write a song and it doesn't come out being corny and cheesy or whatever. Because I think with poetry, it's free flowing. You know, you can yeah. you're not you're not you're not dictated by a certain structural rhythm or, or anything like that. Um, so as i say for me when i write when i write poetry it's coming from a place of reflection and sometimes sadness but for me singing comes from a place of of, of kind of happiness a lot of the time so it's very difficult for me to mix the two but yeah. i'm always intrigued by people who can understandable now obviously i want to go into your poetry anyway because obviously people know this does touch on music and variety but poetry obviously is main love now obviously mm-hmm. um you what made you want to start performing your poetry? Because I think, well, speak easy the first time you've done that. And why I imagine things. I yeah. thought it was. I thought I remember you telling yeah. me that one as well. So, yeah. obviously, you told me off mic before how you found out about us. So, tell us how you found out about us and what made you want to go and read to be a poetry live. Then. So, I think I took my success from kind of um, singing and just applied that methodology with with, with um, poetry because I knew that was, you know, another love of mine. I, I really enjoyed um 
uh, the feeling that, that writing poetry uh, kind of gives me and, and and listening to other people's stories and experiences so um again i think you know facebook is a great tool to just find loads of different communities and and expose yourself to people that you wouldn't necessarily um you know meet in, in your normal day-to-day -day life so um yeah and i think also having grown up in chores and i know that it's really a community of of of, of, of people who who do jump you know who really do enjoy the art and there's lots of live music and, and poetry events and things so um yeah I came across speakeasy through um you know having a look on Facebook and it just it, it looked like a really kind of welcoming place you know it, it didn't look like an intimidating event where you know you had to have so many awards lined up and whatever before you could um you know read your poetry out to the world it just looked like a really lovely community of people with with um you know great stories and, and that's kind of how I came across speakeasy yeah, that's what speakeasy is, is really, because like it's. And I'll say, I'm not going to start harping on because Sarah knows it anyway. Like I said, but but yeah, the night I go run with Stephen and Amanda, that's what we are because we're here to support people. Mm -hmm. It's an open playing ground, no headlines. Everybody gets a chance to read maybe four minutes. And Sarah, you read what? Five, is it four or five times you read for us now? Well, I've lost count over time. It's somewhere around that territory, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah, I was in a really good routine. I um, I was uh, at December, January, February, and then I moved house in march and i've just been getting my life back together since then but i'll, I'll be i'll be at the next one yeah it makes you for. which we're looking forward to seeing you as well so okay i'm gonna to have to ask you then because obviously we've been relatively new to reading your poetry then tell us about then how it felt being on stage doing your poetry first time because i know mm. you surprised me when you told me because i didn't ask you this before you told me afterwards it was your first time ever reading and i was and me and amanda both sat there saying good god <laughs> <laughs> in a good way right <laughs> I mean it's so interesting that you say that because I thought you know having um sung for lots of different audiences that it would be a breeze that there'd be you know that I wouldn't feel any kind of like nerves or anything but honestly it was I felt so like, um, nervous because you're exposing these thoughts and words and 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 you know, feelings that you've had for such a long time and you know for, for everyone to you know listen to and, and to 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 understand um so I found it really daunting um and also I think when I when I when I um when I see all the other uh, readers on the stage they have amazing stage presence um whether that's whether they you know they, they're just not glued to to reading off their their, their piece of paper or, or their mm. screen that you know they're, they're very engaged with their audience around them and I, and I and I felt a bit a little bit intimidated by that because I I would like to aspire to be the same and um, so it's 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 really flattering that you say that but it was far more nerve-wracking than any gig that I've sang at <laughs> it's probably down to the fact was you like you, you got the experience of performance haven't you mm. and it probably helped you mask it I think probably to a degree with that really so yeah. but no yeah. it's getting his easy he's done because I'm not gonna say how long I've been reading for but just say it's been a bloody long time right and I can mm -hmm. remember my first gig and oh the second one was worse because I had two pints of lager before I went on stage and then we then went and whiskey chases afterwards and I don't remember much about oh, wow. getting up the next morning. <laughs> That's the best way to put it to you. But yeah, it's it yeah. is what it is with things like that. But no, I get you completely. Have you found then since you started performing, say just for us at the moment, has your poetry mm -hmm. actually changed anyway, do you reckon? Has it developed the watching other people? I think more than anything, it's just been reassuring. Um mm. So whilst I can see there's lots of different styles of poetry, I can see where mine fits in and I can see that there's others who have similar, um, I think, because I think with my poetry, it's very um, conceptual. I don't necessarily write um, creative pieces so much, which are um, very, you know, descriptive of, of, of the tangible. Mm. I think it's very much about a lot of the time it's, you know, it's perception and, and how you, yeah. Yeah. how you read the words off, off off the page um so i think I, I i just feel more reassured to carry on in the direction of 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 the poetry that 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 i enjoy um rather than feeling a pressure to to write in a certain specific way no you do you've got you've got dead right there because you're following your own nose of it and it's i think mm. it's a good tip anywhere doing poetry and sort of fiction and that line of things you follow what you're most comfortable with and then mm. you just make it better, basically. And you are, you, it works really, really good. Now, I don't want to go too much into your poetry now, because what we're going to do, we'll take a break in a minute, because I want to give you time to read out what your pieces you've got with us, and we'll talk about each piece individually. 
as we go along. So, so what we'll do, Sarah, we'll wrap up this part, part one now. But before we do, can you just tell us, do you have any sort of ideas where you like your creativity to go next? Day? Say that again, sorry. Sorry, yeah, to wrap up part one, um, do you have any sort of ideas where you'd like your creativity to go next? Ah, interesting. Um, honestly, I just like exposing myself um, to, to, to the, the different people and the different um, you know, connections that you can make um, and kind of following it in, in, in that way. I don't really... It's a good question. I don't really plan ahead and think this is the mm. next goal. I mean, in a sense, yes. Yeah. So I, I know that I would like to do more kind of um, busking. Uh, I'd mm. like to do that in terms of the singing style of things. I've never actually done that. Um, yeah. that that's really difficult, doing busking. So would you do that with backing tracks then, would you? Or would you do it with live music? I think music I would, yourself? yeah. Well, yeah, I think I'd do backing tracks. Good luck yeah. with them, definitely. And so, in, yeah. in terms of poetry, sorry, mm. man. Yeah, yeah, sorry, go on. I'm, yeah. uh, I'm cutting you off. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. And then in terms of the poetry, I think it is just a case of, I, you know, I am a newbie in this kind of world, so I, I just really um, enjoy, as I say, just exposing myself to all the different people and and um, possibilities and just kind of following in, in that direction. No, I could look, but definitely so. If you, I know. What we'll then do is, I'm sorry, if people want to find out more about you, where do you recommend mm -hmm. they go? Um... So I, I have uh, social media, as most people do nowadays. Um, so you can you can find me on Instagram. Uh, my name is just my name, so Sarah, Sarah Jane Hack. Um, uh, I also have a link on my Instagram, so it will take you to my singer page on Encore. And then also my YouTube, so you can, you can see my singing videos on there. And a little bit of poetry, actually, on there. Um, yeah, that's where you can find me. Sounds good to me. You've also got a linked tree page as well, haven't you, as well? But I'll put that in the write-up anyway, so that's where it's been helpful. We list, list your solo page on YouTube, your encore page, and obviously when you're in your duo as well, so brilliant. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll take a quick break, everybody. When we come back, we're going to have some poems from Sarah, and we're going to talk about each piece individually to go along. So come back to this, because she's fantastic. Spoken oh, label. At the end, spoken label, the amazing Sarah Jane. Straight over to Sarah, she's going to do five poems for us and then we've got to talk in between each piece over to you Sarah brilliant so I'm going to start with uh, one of my pieces which is called the invisible scoreboard and um, it's the first poem that I wrote um really that I've got a record of um and it was when I was 21 uh, so back in 2016 um and me and my partner um who I met in uni and we're still together um we uh, it was our first flat that we lived in just as a two um, so the poem was kind of born from the little frustrations that you find um, kind of when you live with somebody um, the, the things that niggle you um, and one of them was you know whose turn it was to wash the pots and it's all these little um, kind of um, you know tally, on, a, on a scoreboard you kind of tally up all these different things that um, kind of annoy you about the other person but you know in the grand scheme of it, it it's, it's not important and that's where the, the, the poem was born from. So it's called The Invisible Scoreboard. The invisible scoreboard that is unable to be seen, but are always present. Past and future are the isochrome for the intangible trophy of trivialities and tantrums. Victory stands in your way, and you're on your way to a certificate of unimportant points. In a pointless system designed to recognise the rights and the wrongs, three strikes and you're out. But you can never be set out of the jail sentence. That is the three tainting wretched words. For it is a felony to replace fact with false judgment. And if the cell of your brain forces you to believe that the invisible scoreboard is fair and true, and that it brings justice to all that is good between both of you, then you can hang your scoreboard and etch it onto the walls of your cell membranes. Because for all that is dark matter, the ghost of the invisible scoreboard will come to haunt you. Oh, I'm really glad you read this one on the first. I think this is the cheekiest one out of the five pieces you've got here, Sarah, to be honest with you. Because <laughs> it, it made me think of the honesty. Like it's, because I get, Amanda, my wife, to been living with me now for what, year four lockdown it was. And I think you do, when you're moving in with somebody like that, it's, it's different. So you're looking at things in a different way, aren't you? And your relationship changes, I think. So, mm -hmm. 
I love the use of the term isochrome in this and also intangible trophy as well, the trivialities and tantrums. Mm. I'm not going to go, I'm not going to, what made you want to use that in isochrome in this piece? Because that's a great word, that one's unusual as well. Yeah, um, I think it's just, it's all about, you know, direction. Um, and I think, you know, kind of all these different tally, you know, you're tallying up all these different things that have niggled you about this person and it's leading you to this direction of, 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 of you know, kind of sometimes bitterness and, 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 and distraction. And it's just, you know, in the grand scheme of things, it's, you know, it's, it's not that important, but when, when you're in those moments, it can just feel really, really annoying and niggling. Um, so it's, it's kind of taking a step back, reflecting on, on the situation and just thinking, you know, it's, it's really not that much of a big deal. No, of course, that makes perfect sense. So, I know if it's a great piece as well. So, okay, back to you for poem number two. Yeah, uh, so uh, the second piece that I'm going uh, to read out is called Stuck in Transit. Um, and that's my most recent poem. Uh, well, one of my most recent that I've, that I've written. And it came from a place of, um, again, frustration, so uh, I think a lot of the time you can kind of, it's very easy to wait for inspiration to come to you. Um, and I think the more that you're waiting for it, it becomes more frustrating. Um, but it's just kind of allowing, so sometimes you can feel that you're stuck in transit and you know everything's a bit quiet and, and dull and, and boring and you're just waiting for this kind of next you know, thing that's going to be exciting. But there's a lot to, to be taken from that from that place of silence and peace and tranquility and a lot of room for growth there. So, uh, yeah, so stuck in transit. The ironic notion of being stuck in motion leads me to notice the problem at hand, that is the reprimanded repetition without grip or command. The yearning for the unknown and still the guidance to be shown, a desire to move away from what I have outgrown. If capacity is to sound as what silence is to vacancy, then opportunity must be both around and surround, bellowing, full-bodied and warm. After all, empty vessels do make the loudest sound. That's got a really great, it's got a really great sound of that piece. I, was, I, th I think I've heard you read that one out of Speak Easy before as well, or if mm. you haven't, I'm getting mixed up. I actually yeah. like that because um, the one thing I'm, Something a bit iffy on some of these rhyming in poetry, but I like the use of the rhythm in this piece of the rhyming. That's mm. why. But I said no, it's got a fantastic sound in it straight away. So first of all, then, what made you call it stuck in transit? Then I'd have been tempted to stuck in motion as a title there. Actually, I must admit. Hmm. Um. I think um it's just kind of ironic, really. Because I think by the fact of something being in transit, you think you know of movement, mm. but obviously the word stuck is is completely stagnant of that. You're you're not moving, so yeah, it's no. kind of again it's it's almost the oxymoron of you know you're stuck in a place, but you're still en route to that. You know it was part of the journey of you getting to that next place. Yeah, no, I've got it straight away. Excellent stuff indeed. I'm. Um... Tell us about the, I love the ending on it as well, about after all, empty vessels do make the loudest sound. And that's like sound in my head, and that one made me think of straight away then. Was that what you, some of the lines you were thinking on yourself for that end of that piece? Yeah, I mean, I, I remember my dad saying it sometimes. So when I was um, growing up, I was quite, um, you know, quite a quiet child. And I remember being mm. in the class and, and you know, um, there's, you know, funnily enough, there'd be, you know, people singing at the top of their voices. That, that you know I wasn't I was never you know kind of like confident enough to be like that or you know the class cl uh, the class clown or anything like that so I remember my dad kind of used to say you know empty vessels make the, the loudest noise so it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a front oh, sometimes yeah. I think right, right. yeah yeah, yeah. No, I'll get it completely I was going to get the idea I got the significance behind it but obviously talking to you today no, it's yeah a great piece okay let's move on to number three then yeah uh, and then the final piece that I, oh, not the final, sorry. The third. Uh, the, third <laughs> <laughs> the third piece that I'm going to read out uh, is called Let's Have Lunch on the Moon. So this one's, I feel it's, you know, a little bit more positive and optimistic, um, but it's still very much about being in a place 
um, but just kind of wanting to be anywhere else but there. You know, sometimes it's just nice to just fantasize and dream about being, you know, on a beach or just somewhere just pleasant and, and you know, where, where you don't have to think about anything. It's just, it's, it's escapism, essentially. So let's have lunch on the moon. Let's have lunch on the moon, a picnic in June, and escape this place now or soon where tranquil blankets of deep shades of blue engulf both me and you. Full moon, three quarters a moon, and half a glass full. Take me to a place somewhere less dull. Seven more shots and strawberry shortcake. Please be mindful of the angle for the photos you take. Never let gravity pull you down. You're destined for more than to hold that miserable frown. And how I always told you to reach above and beyond. Don't let it pull away at this bond. The radiant ball that lights up the sky that you can't get away from no matter how hard you try. On the move, but you're sat in a car and still it follows you wherever you are. Always one step ahead. You can run, but you can't hide. And in the very same instance, watch it fade behind its very own shade. As a child, that's the game I always played. Take me back to cloud 23, where we can just simply be. We will perch on top, spectators of the world. We raise our glass and we lower our eyes as we gaze down below. Let this just be a place that I used to know. That last line is absolutely it's beautiful there. Really, it's really, really, it's quite... I think it's floaty in places, this piece, this one, mm. Sarah, in contrast to your visit. I've really enjoyed this piece. And I know that if people are wondering, want to check your solo YouTube page out, this one is on there as well. Mm. And it's, it's really, it's got, I, there's something about it. I just love pieces where, like, make you want to curl up in a ball, basically, in a nice way. Yeah, definitely. I, I definitely tried to kind of have this kind of dreamy feeling to it. And, and when I picture it, you know, I kind of imagine that you are, you know, you're sat on a little moon up in space with all the, you know, all the space, literally all the space around you, and it's just, you know, really serene and calm, and 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 yeah, it's, it's nice that, that that you can you can picture that as well. I think it's it's like, and I bet it wasn't wrote this way either. It feels like a, it could have been like a dream or some kind of nice mm. dream or something you've had. I think a lot of us would like sometimes. And that's why it's. I just look. There's a lot I like about this piece, certainly like where I love the bit of three quarters of the moon and a half glass. Three quarters of a moon and a half a glass full. And it put mm. take me to a place somewhere less dull. I thought the rhyming is absolutely really, really nice. I mean, it works and that. And it's, it's just a plain beautiful piece. So that's why. Yeah. So I'm, I'm the clock. I can't tell you if you've read that one. I'll speak easier because I'm what you probably have, but I don't remember mm. it. So but it's a beautiful piece. <laughs> so <laughs> okay. Mm. On to piece number four then. So piece number four is called The Encore. Um, and again, it's um, very much a kind of like a play on words. But I wrote this whilst I was in university. So I think, obviously, you know, when you're in uni, there is very much this culture of, you know, you go out, you drink, you come home, you go to your lecture, and then you do the same thing again on repeat. Um, so I feel it was very much kind of inspired by that um, kind of period of my life. And as much as it's, you know, it's, it's fun to go out with your friends and, and you know, have a laugh and stuff, but... You know, it, it can become a you know it can become draining. You know, doing the same thing each day. Um, but yeah, so that's where this was born. So the encore. So curtains down, blinds folded. The iridescent shade of night welcomes the last one standing. They say there's no rest for the wicked, but yet oh how I know how easy it is to fall into a rosé infused sleep. Rosé tinted glasses on. A state meant to be or not to be. This is the question at hand. I tried to take a stand, but then you held my hand. So together we will bow down to them all. As dusk turns to dawn, a new day is born. Beneath a groundbreaking shakes. As the earth warms up to swallow each victim whole. Heartedly, sight is shattered and so am I. Curtains up, blinds unfolded. The audience roar, ready for the encore. Again, really great last line there as well for that one. <laughs> Tell us about the ending then, obviously, then, because it's, I do like, do really do like curtains up, blindfolds unfolded. The, then mm. you're doing a line break, the audience roar, ready for the encore. 
Mm. That's that's nice. It's really nice that bit. Mm. So yeah, I think it is about being a little bit stuck in a rut of of the mm. same routine day in day out. But there is that kind of peer pressure around you to to kind of carry on and and you know onto the next night. Um, so that's kind of what I mean by you know the encore. Yeah, it feels like it's talking about your singing. It feels as well that you talk about your singing there with that one actually as well. Continue. Yeah, I, yeah, I think yeah, definitely there is um, an element of that as well. No, it's excellent. Anyway, let's go on to the big conclusion now. I was expecting <laughs> you to be honest. It shows you how my brain thinks here. I was just, I thought you might have done that encore as your last piece, but you've done yeah. the one you're doing now is the what well, I think is probably the angriest one out of the five that you sent across to me, actually. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll be honest with you, it wasn't strategic. Um I did have it in mind that I was I was gonna do three. So I <sighs> I did think that I would be ending um on um let's have lunch on the moon just because of it being up you know uplifting yeah um so it's, it's not it's not actually strategical but i'll um <laughs> try and find a way to justify why that's fine <laughs> over to you sir for number five then so the fifth one is you reap what you sow so you're right it, it definitely is the most angriest of, of of my of my pieces and again it was written at a time um in my life where i did feel um that I wasn't I wasn't being true to myself in, in in as I say in what sparks the joy and the passion within me and I felt very much I was just going along um with the with the mundane mon, you know Monday to Friday nine to five is as we all have to you know to, to, to kind of get, like, get by in life but um this was kind of me reflecting on on that bitterness I suppose so yeah you reap what you sow the silent sulking silhouette that I had once met now wavers beneath the shadow of a throne Neglected legacies drawn but never sown, still they surge my thoughts, and carefully crafted out dreams are replaced by pulled apart stitches, at least that's how it seems. The nonchalant silhouette that I had once met does often still call to remind me of a routine of purpose, of which I do forget. It's interesting this one, because when I read this, I is. You've actually read this in a way I didn't expect you to read it. Actually, it was quite interesting this because I think it's definitely a language piece you've done out of the five mm. of them. But it's all that way you read it was actually probably quite probably the softest, if that makes sense. Mm. Yeah, definitely. I think so. It is about feeling, you know, stuck. Um, again, feeling very stuck in in the mundane. But it's then having that moment of of kind of of remembering what it is that I, you know, that that, that sparks that joy within me. But then being pulled back into the kind of the mundane again, and it's those moments of just tapping into those moments of inspiration and 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 and, and letting them guide you along, rather than being pulled and sucked into kind of, as I say, the, the, the mundane. Yeah, yeah, no, great stuff indeed. It's been, it's been a great session today, so I want to thank you for this today. Really, really enjoyed yeah. this. But nice to actually, because sometimes people have seen this. I don't often go and do do a deep dive in people's poetry because I don't. I think it's it's their own, it's their own words. But no, it's been nice to see you today because I thought we've been quite new to let people see your train of thought and been mm. really, really interesting. So thank you for that today. Now hang around, Scott. Do need to quick chat to you off microphone anyway. But well, thank you mm -hmm. again. Keep in touch, and no doubt we're we'll hopefully keep seeing it speak easy for a bit, a bit more to come yet. Yeah, definitely for sure. No, thank you for having me. It's been really good. Okay, guys and girls, well, that's it for another session of Spoken Label today. Uh, as Don Callis at AEW Wrestling says, stay safe, and most importantly, stay home. Spoken Label.